In this video, I'm going to go through a few examples uh, relating to modules one and two uh, to try to help you prepare or get the process started in preparing for exam one. Okay, so um, before I get to those questions, let me just mention a few things about exam one. Uh, first thing, use this list of topics. I go ahead and print it. I print it every time I'm about to write an exam. I use it as a checklist to make sure there's a question, basically, um, yeah, that, that the number of points in the exam are well distributed uh, throughout all these modules, and that there's basically a question from most of these topics. So um, use this as a checklist. You know how to do, if you're really good with knowing the difference between a population sample parameter and statistic, check that off, that you know how to do it. If you don't feel as comfortable with it, do some more practice problems. Um, and where will you find those? Uh, you'll find practice problems. You should be looking through all previous things that I've assigned thus far, such as the homeworks, the supplemental handouts, uh, you know, et cetera. So, um, you know, to look through everything that I've assigned thus far, go to the assignments in the PLE and, and look back through that checklist. If there's anything that you missed, maybe you didn't have time for a supplemental handout in the past, now's the time that you'd want to do that, right? To go back and do that. And if you did do it, but you're still feeling a little weak on it, uh, go ahead and do it again, you know? Um, so that's, that, those tools are there for you and you should really be using them uh, to, to prepare for this exam. You will not find a question from, on the exam that's not similar to a question that you've already seen. Okay, so if you review all of the material I have provided, you should not be surprised uh, when you see any questions on the exam. Okay, um, so I'm gonna go through these questions here. These are questions that are really good type practice questions for the exam. Um, there also is a practice exam that's posted in the PLE and in Blackboard. And um, so that practice exam, you should go ahead and take that. Once you've studied everything, you've done some considerable amount of studying, take the practice exam as if you're taking the real exam. Check your answers. Um, and then, you know, if you have any questions about the practice exam, post that to the discussion board, okay? So I'm not going to make a video um, giving the answers for the practice exam. Rather, the practice exam um, answers are just posted in a PDF. So you can check your answers, but then if you have any questions about anything, I'll make a video to try to talk you through that, or we'll just have a written discussion if, if that's sufficient in Blackboard discussion board. Okay, so, um, you know, please use this time now to be studying, use this time to be asking questions to me because I'm looking forward to seeing those questions in Blackboard. So I really um, you know, want to see them and, and, and have discussions and, and talk to you as you're preparing for your exam, okay? All right, so now let's go ahead and move into the module one uh, type questions that I've, I've, I've prepared here. Um, so the first thing in module one, we talk about uh, difference between a population and a sample and a parameter and statistic. It's a really popular type of question that you'll see on the exam is identifying what is the population, what is the statistic, what or what is the population, what is the sample, what is the parameter, what is the statistic, okay? So let's read through this question. Um, we have U.S. News and Re um, World Report wrote an article regarding registered nurses' pay. RNs pay. In 2013, they conducted a survey of 159,934 RNs in the U.S., and they reported an average salary of $68,910 per year. Select the correct label for each description. All right, so um, the selected uh, 159,934 registered nurses, okay? So what's going on here? We have, we have a population. From that population, we went and we get a sample, right? That's, that's the way uh, sampling works, right? You have a huge population, and then you go out and you get a subset of that, subset of these population members, and then you get a sample, right? So what is the big, big population here? Well, it'd be all RNs, right? All registered nurses, right? So the sample would be a subgroup of those RNs. 
So it would be the 159,934 RNs. So this is the sample. So all RNs in the United States, that's the population, right? When you see it's all of them, that's everyone, that's the entire population, okay? So the average pay for the selected um, 159,934 RNs in the United States. So the average for the sample, remember from the sample you get a statistic, right? So from the sample you get the statistic, S goes with S, sample statistic. Okay, um, the average pay for all RNs in the United States, P goes with P, P, P population, P parameter. Okay, so the average from the population uh, is the parameter. Okay, identify the type of data as quantitative continuous, quantitative discrete, or qualitative, right? So this is basically discrete and continuous and a qualitative quantitative type problem, okay? Um, so dog breed. So dog breed would be things like a lab, dachshund, um, shih tzu, uh, terrier, that type of thing, okay? So we're, what we're talking about is not numbers, so they're categories, right? These are categories, this is a qualitative type data. Qualitative for categories. Zip code. Now zip code is a number, but it's Kind of one of those special numbers where it doesn't actually represent you know any sort of like count or anything like that it's just a number that represents a category right the category is where you live so this is not a number that you can do any math with right um so zip code this is a also a category so it is a qualitative type data okay number of candidates running for president so that's a count Right, so this is a number, this is a count, and it's a meaningful number. You can do math with it, right? So this is a quantitative type data. Now, you're counting zero, running for president, one, two, three, you know, it's discrete. It's going up. It's a count going up in, uh, in, it's in, in going up in even increments, right? So zero, one, two, etc. So that is discrete, quantitative discrete. All right, you're now your temperature. Now your temperature, that's also a number, right? And so it is a quantitative type data. Um, is it continuous or discrete? Well, it's zero degrees Celsius, or sorry, Fahrenheit. So zero degrees Fahrenheit or one degree Fahrenheit. Is there anything in between? Sure, it could be half a degree Fahrenheit. Now what about between zero and a half a degree Fahrenheit? Yeah, it could be 0.25 degree Fahrenheit, right? You you could continue. You can get even more and more precise thermometers that will read to more and more decimals, right? So this is a. And you're only limited by the preciseness of your instrument, right? So temperature is a continuous type measurement. So this is a quantitative continuous. All right. Now going on to different levels of measurement. All right, um, length of a newborn. So this is length in inches. Okay, so this is this is not nominal or ordinal because uh, your your length nominal is like a category basically, right? And or and ordinal is kind of like a category that you can order. Um, so length is length is not that it's a number it's a number that you can do math with right like quantitative type data right so um, is it interval or ratio well interval is really reserved really for only a few things uh, things that um, don't have a meaningful zero right which is not many um, things that don't have a meaningful zero but a few examples are like temperature and Fahrenheit right where um, the zero degree Fahrenheit is really just a marker between negative degrees Fahrenheit and positive degrees Fahrenheit but it's not a meaningful zero right it doesn't mean that there's an absence of temperature um, another example is like an, a standardized test score so if you take the SAT and you get a, and there's a zero there that's that doesn't mean that you didn't take the SAT right uh, standardized test scores do not 
Uh, unlike unlike a traditional test score where if you get a zero that means there's an absence of any points right a traditional test score is not interval but a standardized test score is because of the special way they calculate their score um, another really popular example is year right zero year that definitely does not mean an absence of time right it was just the marker between um, you know BC and AD right uh, it's not an absence of years. So interval is really only reserved for a few things. Um, most of the time, if you're measuring something, it's going to be ratio. Okay, so we're measuring the length um, in inches. This is this is a ratio type measurement. All right, nurses' salary, same deal. Right, this is um, a account of the uh, the nurse's income, right? So sixty some thousand dollars per year. Uh, you can do math with that number. This is another ratio type data. All right, TV network ratings. So this would be it, even if it is a number like a rate from zero to ten, right? That's a number that represents a category, zero being bad and 10 being good, right? That's a number that represents a category. So this is not really a number that you do standard math with, right? Um, this, is, this is an order that you're assigning to a cat, ordering to a different categories, right? So step up from nominal versus, you know, categories you can't put in any order, but we do put order on the categories that makes it ordinal, ordinal type data. Ethnicity. So ethnicity is a category, but there's no order associated with it, right? Uh, that you know, so eth eth ethnicity is just nominal type data, no ordering, so nominal. Okay. So moving on to module two type problems. All right, in module two, we talk a lot about frequency distributions and histograms. So you need to feel really good with each of these concepts, okay? So um, here we have the frequency distribution um, for monthly rents for a sample of college students, okay? Uh, first question is determine the class width. So, you know, basically, if you were to think this through, um, what's going on here is we have basically five five uh, college students that are reporting um, their monthly rent between $100 and $199. Seven that are reporting between $200 and $299, right? Um, so if I were to kind of draw this out, I always like to draw a number line when I'm talking about frequency distributions. Um, so here's 100, okay, 200, 300, 400, 500 is over here. Okay, I guess I ran out of room, but 600, I guess, is here. All right, so basically there's like five people that report between 100 and, well, actually 199, right? 100 and 199. If someone had a rent of 200, they got pulled into the next group. Uh, so seven people are between 200 and, I guess, 299. Right, so what's the class width? The class width is the width between here and here, between the lower limits, or you could think of it as between the upper limits, but it makes more sense to think about it as in terms uh, the between the lower limits, right? The distance between the lower limits. So between 100 and 200, what's that distance, right? So in this case, the class width would be 100, right? We go 100 to get here, 100 to get here, 100 to get there, right? We're going up by 100, okay? All right, um, what percentage of college students have a monthly rent less than $300? All right, so let's see. Um, I have less than $300. So I have five and seven students that are reporting less than $300, right? So that makes 12 students reporting less than $300. 12 out of how many? So I need to do 12 plus nine plus three plus one. 25 students. So 12 out of 25. Now it's asking for what percentage. So let me go ahead and multiply that by 100% to get my answer. 
So 12 divided by 25 times 100 is 48. 48 percent. Okay, we should also be able to fill out this entire um, uh, frequency distribution table. So let me go ahead and let's go ahead and do this. So class boundaries, remember class boundaries, what they are is basically kind of, um, you know, it basically stops this gap between 99 and 200, right? It kind of like fills in the gap between those two, right? So what's in between 199 and 200? Uh, 199.5, right? So that'll be the upper bound, or yeah, upper bound of the first first class. And then we still need it to be a width of 100. So I still need. So if I went up a little bit by um, by 0.5, I also need to go down a little bit by 0.5. So I'll go 99.5, right? And so now the width between 199.5. And, or sorry, 99.5 and 199.5 is still 100, right? You want to maintain that class width of 100, okay? Then from 99.5, sorry, 199.5, I'll go to 299.5. So 199.5 to 299.5. That'll be my next one. 299.5. Okay, let me make sure this is all red. Okay. All right, and then notice that class boundaries, unlike class limits, you see how the lower and upper don't match, right? Uh, class boundaries, they do match though, right? So boundaries, remember, they get rid of the gap. That's basically what boundaries do. They get rid of the gap, okay? So this next one will be 299, 299.5, right? So that's the lower matching the upper. Okay, and then it'll go all the way to 399.5. Okay, next one will be 399.5. That's the upper matching the lower. And now go to 499.5. And then this is 499.5, and it will go to 599.5. All right, now class midpoint, that's halfway between the uh, class boundaries or the class limits, it doesn't matter. If you made your class boundaries correctly, the midpoint between the class boundaries should be the same as the midpoint between the class limits, okay? So the way you find the midpoint is you basically just average the two endpoints, okay? So take, for example, 100 plus 199 and divide it by 2. So that should be one, 100 plus 199 and divide that by 2, 149.5. Okay, then this one will be 249.5. 349.5, 2, 449.5, and 549.5, right? So just taking 500 plus 599 and then dividing that by two. All right, so you do that for each of these guys. All right, relative frequency. Remember, relative is relative to the total, right? The total frequency here is 25, right? If you add up all of five plus seven plus nine plus three plus one, you get 25. So what is five relative to 25? You take five divided by 25 a lot of times we report relative frequency as a percentage, so that would be 20%. Okay, uh, what is seven divided by 25 times 100? 28%. Okay, nine divided by 25 times 100 is 36%. And 3 divided by 25 times 100 is 12%. And 1 divided by 25 times 100 is 4%. Okay. Cumulative frequency. Now, for cumulative frequency, you accumulate upwards as you count, as, as you go down. So you start at the lowest class, start with 5, and then you add on 7. 5 plus 7 is 12. Then you add on 9, 
12 plus 9 is 21. Then you add on 3 is 24. And you add on 1, 25. Now your final, cum the bottom cumulative frequency should match your total sample size. Okay? All right. So now go to, in to interpreting histograms. So below is a frequency histogram for 180 teachers' income during their first year from college. Okay. Uh, what percentage of the sample makes less than $40,000? So here's the $40,000 cutoff, right? And we want to know what percentage is making less than that. So what I need to do is figure out how many people are making less than that in this sample. So I'll take 13 plus 14 plus 15 plus 22. I get 64. Out of, there's 180 teachers, right? If I add up all of these, I should get 180. So let me go ahead and double check that. I'll do 64 plus 25 plus 26 plus 30 plus 35. Good, I got 180. So the total sample size here is 180. So 64 out of the 180. Now it says what percentage. So I need to multiply that by 100%. So times 100%. And what I get is 35.6%. Okay. Um, so below is a relative frequency histogram. So here it says relative frequency. Remember here was frequency. This is like the count. There's 13 people that made between 15 and $25,000, right? Here it's a percentage. So there basically are 10% um, of the days are between 70 and 75 degrees in July in New York City. So now this question is, what percentage of July days in New York is the temperature more than 85 degrees? Oops, that was a really poorly drawn line. Here we go. Percent, what percentage is more than 85 degrees? So here's the 85 degree line, and we want to go upwards, more than. So 30% of the days are between not eight, um, are between uh, 85 and 90 and 25% uh, of the days are between 90 and 95 so I would want to add up those two percents and I would get 55% of the days are more than 85 degrees in July in New York Alright, so in the next video, I will go ahead and do some more sample problems from the uh, other modules that will be covered in this exam. If you have any questions about um, the problems that I've done here, please uh, feel welcome to post that in the discussion board.